This is called Four Common Pitfalls of the Believer, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Heavenly Father, we just pray that your word goes forth, not return void, but does the thing that it was set forth to do and accomplish that which is set forth to accomplish. Lord, I bind the atmosphere. I come against any demonic powers, hindrances, and things that would turn our attention to, away from receiving the word of God this morning. And I pray that you'd have your way, have your will in this service. Lord, revolutionize people's lives, change them, transform them. And bless them today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the clouds, speaking about the children of Israel when they came out of Egyptian bondage. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, that rock was Christ. It's interesting, if you go to the book of Exodus chapter 17, verse 6, it says, Moses smote the rock on Mount Horeb, and water came forth sufficient to satisfy all the multitude there in the wilderness. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink out, uh, I'm sorry, and gave them drink as, as, as out of the great depths. He brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run like rivers. Psalm 78, verses 15 and 16. Um, Paul indicates that the miracle had great symbolic significance as well. Uh, that rock was Christ. The Greek word used here for rock is Petra. The same word used by Christ when he said, when he was speaking with Peter, and he said, Upon this Petra, or rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Christ is the one foundation upon which the church is built. 1 Corinthians 3.11 He is also symbolized by the living water. He is the well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 4.10-14 the actual rock from which the waters burst forth in the wilderness uh, did not literally follow them. Okay? Um, but that spiritual rock, in essence, did follow them, and that rock was none other than Jesus Christ. Um, it's called a theophany, which is an Old Testament manifestation of Christ before he came embodied in the flesh. Come on. He looked at Abraham, or he looked at the Pharisees, and said, Before Abraham was, I am. In other words, come on, he was the fourth man as, of, as in the Son of God in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How was Jesus in the fire when he was not even born yet? Because before he ever came in the flesh, he dwelt with the Father and the Holy Spirit as the Son. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Amen? So Christ has always been... He, does, he just wasn't manifested in Bethlehem when he was born, come on, out of the virgin. He has always been. How many sees that? Um, so, now, these streams uh, flow continually in the desert for 40 years so the children of Israel could march and camp beside them as long as they were in the wilderness. Christ still today is our spiritual rock, continually yielding the spiritual waters of everlasting life. And the, the bottom line is here, guys, that for 40 years they were in a wilderness and they were satisfied by the spiritual rock. So it doesn't matter what your environment is today, Christ is still with you. Whether you be on the mountain, whether you be in the valley, whether you be in the springs, of, uh, 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 whether you be like David said, he leads me by still waters, or whether you be in a dry and thirsty land. Come on, Elijah, if he has to, he'll send ravens to feed you for a time, and then when the brook dries up, he'll move you somewhere else. So, Verse 5, but with most of them, we're going on with 1 Corinthians chapter 10, but with most of them, speaking of the children of Israel, God was not well pleased. Uh-oh. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Numbers 14, 22. 
Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not listened to my voice. Numbers 14, 29. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Numbers 14, 32. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness. Numbers 14, 37. Even those men that did bring up the evil report on the land died by the plague before the Lord. Numbers 26, 65. For the Lord had said of them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was none left a man of them, save Caleb the son of Jephaniah and Joshua the son of Nun. Deuteronomy 1, 35. Surely there shall not one of those men of this evil generation see that good land which I swore to give your fathers. Deuteronomy 2, 14. I'm going somewhere with this, so just buckle your seatbelt and hold on. And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barinia until we came until we come over the brook Zered with was 30 and 80 years until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the hosts as the Lord swore to them Ezekiel 20 36 like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt so I plead with you saith the Lord God Hebrews 3 17 but with whom was he grieved 40 years was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness and finally Jude 1 5 I will therefore put you in remembrance though you once knew this how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed them that believed not Heavy, isn't it? Now, let's go back to our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, verse 5. He says, But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, now these things became our examples. Look at your neighbor and say they became examples. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them as it is written, <clears throat> quote, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And that leads us to where I wanted to go initially at the beginning of this message. Four common pitfalls of the believer, and they are all shadowed out right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to go with them right now. Number one, uh, idolatry. Number two, sexual immorality. Number three, tempting Christ. And number four, complaining. I want to say it again. The four pitfalls that are common unto you and I and every believer that snares us and causes us to get the fullness of what God has for us and many times causes us to fall short of where God has us to go are number one, idolatry. Number two, sexual immorality number three tempting Christ and number four complaining and if you don't mind I'd like to plow on all four of them right now number one idolatry according to the Hebrew Bible it is defined as the following number one the worship of idols or images number two the worship of polytheistic gods by use by use of idols or images number three the worship of animals or people uh, uh, I'm sorry, number four, the use of idols in the worship of God. And you, if you, I didn't put this in here, but you can go to Romans chapter 1, and it talks about that in the whole chapter. It says, when they knew God, they didn't worship Him as God, and they made four-footed creatures and winged creatures and this and that, and they made them both to speak and to live, and they worshiped the creature rather than the Creator. It's right there in Romans chapter 1. Okay, and this would, and I'm going to give you some examples in the Old Testament. Ready? And will make them applicable to us. The ancient Babylonian and Assyrian goddess Ishtar, by the way, I'll really stir you up here, is where we get the root word Easter from. The ancient Babylonian and Assyrian goddess Ishtar 
symbolized Mother Earth and the natural cycles of fertility on Earth. By the way, that's why the rabbit is the symbol of Easter. Did you know that? You're learning something new this morning. Oh, now, Pastor, you going to preach on Easter like that? Yeah. Because it's resurrection, not Easter. Listen, and don't, get, don't get all flustered and, and I, people's blood pressures are rising. I'll get the ugly emails and all this stuff. Listen, what you do and how you celebrate Easter is your business. I'm going to say, I'm going to take it a step further. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm going to let my son do an Easter egg hunt. Oh my gosh, and I'll get letters for that right there. I can't believe you would let your kid participate in that. Now, first of all, let me finish. See, people never let you finish. Because you can take something that the, that the enemy intensely uh, tended for evil and turn it to good. Because what you do is you can take the eggs and you can put pieces like uh, a nail. You can put a piece of red thread. You can put different pieces that represent the resurrection in these eggs with the candy. So you're teaching them not about Ashtar or a sexual fertility goddess, but you're teaching them about Christ. Come on. You got to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. How many understand what I'm talking about? But I'm just letting you know, so don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you facts and truth. But that's, again, that's where Easter originated from. And by the way, the Playboy Bunny, hello, has to do with sexual fertility, has to do with sexual immorality. It's all interconnected. Hello. Whew. Uh, many myths grew up around this female deity, and that's what it was. She was the goddess of love, so the practice of ritual prostitution became widespread in the fertility cult dedicated to her name. Temples to Eshtar had many priests and priestesses or sacred prostitute, prostitutes who symbolically acted out the fertility rites of the cycle of nature. Ishtar has been identified with the Phoenician uh, Astartate, the Semitic Ashtoreth, and the Egyptian Isis, the Greek Aphrodite, and the Roman Venus, Ishtar's male fertility counterpart, was Tamos, who was closely associated with the Canaanite fertility god Baal. How many's ever heard of Baal in your Bible? If you've never heard that, go to the story of Elijah the prophet, and he dealt with the prophets of Baal. See, it's all connected. How many's learning something this morning? Now, Adremelech was a god worshipped by child sacrifice. I'm going somewhere. Egyptians, Egyptian gods were figures of men with heads of animal or birds. How many's ever seen that? Maybe on the History Channel where I'm talking about. The Canaanite god most often referred to as Baal, who was thought to provide productive forces of nature. Baal was worshipped with much sensuality as with the male shrine prostitutes. Baal and related deities are also portrayed as, as a mating bull, symbolizing fertility. Baal's mistress or lover was Anet. Anet is sometimes identified with the queen of heaven, and mentioned in Jeremiah. It's all there. If you read the book of Jeremiah, it talks about that. Because uh, they were baking cakes in, 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 uh, in worship of this, uh, this uh, deity. Uh, Annette, or Annette was the patroness of sex and passion. Lewd figurines of this nude goddess and various objects with exaggerated, exaggerated sexual features <clears throat> have been discovered at various archaeological sites in Palestine. And by the way, we have them right here in America too. If you go to certain places, you'll see them. Maybe you've never seen some, but I have. All right. Moloch. How many's ever heard of the god of or the god the idol god Moloch? You should have. I've been. I've taught on this many times. This was the national deity of the Ammonites. Oh, y'all didn't even get that. It was the national deity of the Ammonites. Do you know what the national sin of America is? Abortion. And it's the same spirit behind it. Remember, go back to your text. The four common hang-ups. Sexual immorality, idolatry, tempting Christ, complaining. I'm going somewhere with this. Watch. Moloch was the national deity of the Ammonites whose worship was accompanied by the burning of, of children offered up in sacrifice by their own parents. 
Shamash, Shamash was the national god of the Moabites who was also worshipped with child sacrifices. Uh, and this goes all through these religions. Uh, even the, uh, the Mayans did it. Um, uh, and Ashtoreth was the ancient goddess of the moon, sexuality, sensual love, and fertility, and is often associated with the worship of Baal. Zeus was the supreme god of the Greeks. According to Greek mythology, he was the ruler of heaven and the father of other gods and mortal heroes. Diana, remember that in the book of Acts? Diana, also called Artemis, was the god, or the, I'm sorry, the goddess of the moon, hunting, and wild animals, and virginity. Aphrodite was the goddess of sensual love. In both the Old and, and New Testaments, the people of God were surrounded by pagan gods. The Apostle Paul declared to the philosophers of A Athens, quote, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. And in the city of Athens, idols of pagan gods stood on every street corner. The Athenians even erected an altar to the unknown god of, uh, in Acts 17, 22-23. Now, you ready for a heavy nugget? In the book of Acts, Paul came to a place called Mars Hill, where every man was worshiping every God and every way was a way to heaven. It's right there. Book of Acts. And Paul rebuked the fire out of him and said that there was only one way to heaven and that was through Christ. Now, y'all didn't get that. It was called Mars. There's two nuggets I want to bring out. Number, first of all, every way is a way to heaven. Every way, it don't matter. Come on, what, what you worship, what idol God you serve, and how you do it, as long as you're quote-unquote religious, you're making it into the kingdom. And if you, just in case you didn't know, that is America's theme right now. Tolerance. Every way is a way to heaven. We've got to be tolerant of other people's religions, other people's beliefs, and thus, every way is to heaven. Don't bash this. Don't criticize this religion. Don't criticize that faith because we're all in the same boat on the same journey. Now, there's a pastor, and I'm going to call him out by name. I don't ever do this, but the man is a heretic, flat out, and he's from Michigan. And he used to pastor a church called, of all things, ready? Mars Hill Church. And the man came out and he preached universalism, which is every way is a way to heaven. How ironic that hell, no one's going to hell. That even Lucifer could be saved and make it to the kingdom and we're all God's children and no one will go to hell in Michigan. Now, the same man has come and he's wrote books, best-selling books called Love Wins. And he's come out now and he's for, uh, he's for sexual equality. In other words, he's blasting the church and saying that we need to get over our bigot mindsets and accept homosexual marriage. Quote, It doesn't matter who we love as long as we love somebody. And who are we to stand in the way of their love? And we should tolerate that in the church. You think that's a... I think that's very odd, guys, that here's Paul in, talk, going to a place called Mars Hill where this same spirit that was there is coming over into America and is now flooding the mainstream churches. There was a church in North Carolina that said they will no longer marry couples any longer until the church accepts homosexual marriage. Well, I'm tired of hearing that preaching. Yeah, and that's your problem. You don't like it? Go, go turn on television and find the smiling guy that always pats you on the back and makes you feel good about you and what kind of a good person you are. But I'm sorry, that's not my ministry. God's called me to be a voice crying in the wilderness. And yeah, well, brother, that kind of preaching will cost you your head. Yeah, but I'll also be called a friend of the bridegroom like John did too. Amen. So I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older. I don't give a rip. Don't matter to me anymore. 
You didn't call me. You didn't set me apart. It was God who called me. And listen, if God supernaturally, and you, you guys, some of you guys know my testimony, some don't, but when you've been through what I've been and what God's protected me with, I don't think God raised me up to be silent and to be, and, and to be uh, a pew warmer. And guess what? He's not called you to be that either. I don't believe that. So what am I talking about? Idolatry was one of the major things that got the children of Israel in big trouble with God. Um, now, I want to go off here, and then when I get back to tempting, tempting Christ, it kind of ties in with this, but we'll get there. Number two, sexual immorality. What is sexual immorality? And I could give you tons of Scripture here, but for sake of time, uh, I don't want to get into a whole lot of this. Incest. Is sexual immorality. Now in the Old Testament, before the blood was tainted and corrupted, you saw that. Come on, Abraham. Or, uh, you, you saw different uh, examples of this, of this in the Bible, right? Come on, Lot, uh, Noah, so on and so forth. But now, don't let some preacher stand up and say, well, you know, the Bible says we can have multiple wives. And You'd be surprised there's people out there that teach that stuff. And they're ignorant of Scripture. I'm sorry, but that's, I don't know how else to explain that. Adultery. Do I really need to... Uh, we don't need to elaborate on it. Adultery is adultery. By the way, uh, pornography is a, is a tie, is a, uh, a form of adultery, in case you didn't know that. Now, I'm going to show you something heavy. Ready? This is Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs 5. Heavy stuff here. Watch this. I want to show you what Solomon instructed his son. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge for the lips of an immoral woman drip honey. In other words, she's a smooth talker. And this doesn't just relate to women. It could be, come on, both. a coin has two sides, honey, not just heads but it has the tails too. So it can be a smooth-talking man and a smooth-talking woman. Come on, the man who wrote this was a smooth talker. Have you ever read, uh, have you ever read the Song of Solomon? Y'all looking at me crazy. Maybe if you ain't, read it. The man knew how to talk. He had a thousand wives. Hello. He had something. <laughs> Come on, that's good preaching whether you want to hear it or not. That's good practical teaching. I don't think he was that good looking, but maybe he was. I don't know. For the lips, watch this. The lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Come on, there's smooth talking people out there. Watch this. But in the end, she is as bitter as wormwood. Wormwood in Hebrew here and in Greek is bitter. There's an asteroid in the book of Revelation called Wormwood. And it comes from the root word bitter. Sharp as a two-edged sword. Her, watch this. This is heavy. Ready? Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life. Her ways are unstable and you don't know them. Come on. Have you ever met somebody unstable? I can't really... There's children present, so I can't really plow like I want to. But you'll notice that most promiscuous people are very unstable people. Come on. You, you, you have to hear their foolishness at work when you go to work. You hear about what they did on Friday night. And then what they did last Friday night. Who they were with Friday night. Who they were with Saturday night. Come on. They're unstable. They can't hold a relationship down. I'm in my eighth marriage. Uh, it's like the woman who came to the pastor and said, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. Uh, I'm, I'm in my eighth marriage. And I want you to pray that this man is the right man because this is my eighth marriage. You know what the pastor told her? He said, Woman, the common denominator is not the man, it's you. <laughs> Come on, y'all get that later. <laughs> remove, <laughs> remove your way Far from her. Now I'm going to speak to all the men this morning. 
Because this really relates to you and me. We will struggle not with emotional ties. Women are attracted to emotional ties. Conversation. Come on. You know, I, listen, I've counseled women before and I've, I've, I've read books. And most of them will say, all, most of the time, you know what they want from you? Men, husbands, to listen. Amen. Just shut up and listen. Amen. I'm preaching myself and I can go a little bit deeper because my wife ain't here. <laughs> If she was, she'd be amen to me. But I've gotten more... Listen, God gave us two ears and one mouth. You know why that is? Because He wants us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And some would say, God should have gave women two mouths and one ear. Because it's a fact that women do talk more than men. <laughs> Come on, it's true. <laughs> but listen... But I'm going to talk to the men. We're not so much... Come on, you, you men got to help me out here this morning because y'all going to make me look like I'm crazy, but I'm not. I know what I'm talking about. Men are not... The, the first attraction is not, oh, well, she's just, she was just a nice girl. Come on, somebody. It's visual. Amen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the rest of y'all will give an altar call and y'all can come up and repent for lying. So listen, men, we, there's things that we need to avoid. Come on. There's things on TV we ain't got no business watching. Well, what do I do? Get some blocks put on that thing, man. Get your wife to block it. Get your friend to block it. Give your friend the passcode. Come on. This is good practical preaching whether you want to receive it or not. Well, that's not deep enough for me. Well, yeah, you can get all the deep stuff you want and lose the simple battles. Because you ain't going to ever get revelation on the big stuff unless you can conquer the little stuff. It's the foxes that spoil the vine anyway. So if you've got a struggle with lust of the eyes, how many believes you shouldn't be going down there to, uh, uh, well, it's not around here anywhere, but you shouldn't go to a theme park where they're all swimming. If you, if you struggle with that, I'm just being honest with you. If you struggle with that, how many believes you should stay out of the magazine section in certain bookstores? There are certain things you shouldn't be watching on TV. You better have blocks on the internet. Hello? And on your phone. Well, there's nothing on my phone. Yeah, there is. Come to me. I'll find something for you. I got something to help you. You mean you got that on your phone? Absolutely. Listen, the Bible says, be not ignorant of Satan's devices. Because I don't know what your weaknesses are, but I know what mine are. And I, I'm gonna, I, I want the victory. And I want to stay with the victory. And I ain't going to lose the victory over something stupid. Because you, listen, you can't even watch TV anymore without something stupid on a commercial. Commercials are just bad as... Um, you know, the, the Super Bowl was one of the greatest examples recently. Um, and, you know, the uh, Hollywood movies have upped the ante. What used to be PG is not PG anymore. It's way worse. So if you rent a PG-13 movie, basically you've, rated, or you've, you've rented a rated R movie. Amen. If you rent an R-rated movie, I'm just letting you know you better watch out. Now listen, I'm not getting all up in your business because that's between you and God. I'm not one of them preachers that believe. I'm not going to sit up here and say, my God, if you've got a TV, you're going to split hell wide open because listen, that's when you and God because there's things I probably watch on TV that you probably can't and there's things that you watch that I can't because my convictions and because your convictions. Go to, come on, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It talks about that. Um, so... And that's a whole other teaching. But here, watch. Remove your way from her. In other words, if I'm going to get in trouble going over here, don't go over there. I can, I've, I've, listen, I've counseled people and they're like, listen, I got, and I talked to them, I got saved. Okay, praise God. And, um, but I keep getting in trouble with my ex-girlfriend. Okay, well, how's that happen? Well, she keeps calling me. Well, dummy, block the number. <laughs> Well, I can't do that. Why? Yeah, okay. Well, she comes to my house. Tell her not to come. Come on, we make up. It's like the person that wants to get set free from smoking. 
Uh oh, watch out now. I really want to be set free from smoking, Pastor. I really do. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Okay, well, first thing we'll do, we're going to go to your house and we're going to throw out all the cigarettes. No, 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 we can't do that. Because what, what if I have a rainy day? What if I have a bad day? I've got to have a reserve. Then you really don't want to be delivered. It's like my stepdad. Come on, I, I can preach. He's not here. He's in heaven today, but thank God. Listen, that man, he drank Heaven Hill whiskey every single day of his life since 12 years old. And he lived to be in his 80s. Every day, Heaven Hill. Fifth. If he couldn't get a fifth, he'd get a pint. He called the liquor store his water hole. I'm going to the water hole today. Okay, whatever. Bye. Um, but the man, I lived with my parents for years. And, that, you know, I get up. Most people get up in the morning. Some people eat breakfast. Some people don't. But I was kind of a breakfast person after a couple hours. I'd get up, fix me some breakfast. As soon as his feet hit the floor, guess what his breakfast was? You guessed it. He'd pop open that can as soon as his eyes opened because he's bound. He was bound by alcohol. Pop open that top and start drinking at Heaven Hill. I'm like, Phew. And uh, I remember now, years before I got saved, he was like, come here. He's like, have you ever tasted this? Now, I wasn't saved then, okay? And I said, uh, and I had I'd tasted beer and all this other stuff. And he's like, come here. No, you need, you need to taste some real man's drink. So I took, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, how bad could it be? And I took a swig. I'm telling you, it was straight gasoline. I, I swear, if I had a match up and spit that thing out, a ball of fire would have gone across the room. I said, my God, how are you not dead? <laughs> but isn't it amazing how people can get bound by stuff that kills them? But yet, it's their idol. See, I'm still in the text. Y'all think I'm on a rabbit trail, but I'm not on this one. Listen. <laughs> Do not go near to her house. But you listen, he I remember one time he's like, I'm gonna stop drinking. And then I noticed one day he didn't have it in his house. But I noticed he kept going out to the garage a lot. <laughs> I was like, well, maybe he's just getting some time to himself. And I went out there one day and found out he was he had a uh, he was keeping pints hid out there in the garage. So again, come on guys. Y'all getting the point? So don't go near to her house. Stay away. Don't put yourself in a compromising position. And we're all guilty of it in some way, form, or fashion, even me. Y'all looking at me crazy. Listen, I don't drink, I don't smoke. But listen, sin is not these big... Come on, we all pull out a list and we say, well, here's sin and murder is all the way up here. And then there's adultery. And then there, we have a whole list. Come on, somebody. We have a whole list. But lying, come on. We all know. And listen, there's not. I'm just letting you know. But I, I'm going with this message. We all think there's a white lie. And then there's a real lie. No, that's not. A white lie? That's not in the Bible. Lying is lying. But we put that way down here and put murder way up here. Now, I'm not. there is levels of sin. Don't get me wrong. But a snare. Listen, a little white lie can come turn into a big lie, and a big lie can turn into a compulsive lie, and then eventually you're an habitual liar, and you can't even discern what's reality and what's truth. Perhaps you know some. You know the guy you go fishing with, and he's always got the bigger fish. He's always shot more deer. He can always lift more weights. Yeah, I know he does. He can bench 200, but I did 210 the other day. And he's lying through his teeth because he's trying to impress people. <laughs> Hello. So we're all guilty of it. Listen, I, you know, I try to stop. I try to watch what I eat. But like a dummy, I walk into a Baskin Robbins with people. Now, how many believes that's not very smart when you're on a diet, when you're trying to watch what you're eating? So I set myself up for failure. Hello. So I can't blame anybody else but me. <laughs> lest you give your honor to others and your years to the cruel one lest aliens be filled with your wealth so these are the consequences to these sins come on the Bible says the wages of sin is death but eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ 
Watch, it gets heavy, ready? Verse 11, and you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed. <whistles> Remember, it's because it says their steps lead to hell. And say, watch what you say. How I have hated instruction and my heart despised correction. In other words, Solomon's saying you can't blame anybody else but you. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly of the, and, and congregation. Now he's shifting here, ready? And he's talking to the marital... How many's married? Raise your hand, come on. Now he's talking to you, ready? Drink water from your own cistern. I don't have to elaborate on that. Y'all get that. Come on, I think you're more spiritual than that. <laughs> Come on, please don't be like the disciples and say, speak plainly to us because you don't want me to do that here with you. <laughs> Drink, water. Drink water from your own cistern and water, running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad? Streams of water in the streets? Let them be only your own and not for strangers within you. Wow. Let them be only your own and not the strangers within you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth or husband as a loving deer and a graceful doe. And now I'm read this is in your Bible, all right? So don't get mad at me. I'm reading the next verse. <laughs> Let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? But how many stories have you heard of faithful wives and husbands that leave their spouse because they want to go drink? Come on, I want to go over here to that fountain because it's pretty. And it don't got no rust on it. And look how... <laughs> Y'all getting this, aren't you? It ain't got no, come on, it ain't got no, it ain't got, and it, listen, and the water's fresh, and the water ain't been there a long time, and it's, and it's, uh, you know, this and that. In other words, honey, the grass ain't greener on the other side. Well, here's an idea, to get you some sandpaper out and sand that old fountain. Love on it. Put some paint on it. Come on, this, is this all right? Yeah. This is practical preaching. I, be, I get tired of hearing it. People leaving their fam, or family, leaving their. You know, you know how I many. It breaks my heart because I did. Listen, I've seen uh, grown people who have all kinds of disorders, all because their dad did something stupid when they were a kid, or their 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 uh, their mother, because they left their father. Their father left the mother, and broken homes cause broken lives. And I'm trying to help somebody. Listen. For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his past. His own iniquities will entrap the wicked man. And he is caught in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of knowledge and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. Wow. That's heavy right there, guys. Now, so... What am I talking about? Sexual immorality, incest, adultery, prostitution, fornication, rape, homosexuality. It's considered sexual immorality, sir, ma'am, whoever you are that's listening to this, because I ain't preaching to my church. They have enough sense. But some of you all need to hear this. I don't, regardless of what these apostates have told you that calls themselves bishop or pastor, or whatever. But homosexuality was, was one of, not the only, was one of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah that got the city destroyed. Uh, and then Paul talks about 1 Corinthians 5, 1. You can study this in your own time. 2 Peter 2, 13 and 14. Jude 4, Revelation 2, 14 and 20. Paul said, let sexual immorality and wickedness, let it not even be named among you. So, this, listen, in other words, you know what Paul's saying? I shouldn't even be preaching this to you. 
This is something the Gentiles know and practice, but you shouldn't even have this preaching to you. But you would be surprised. Because he had to go to a church, uh, he had to go to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and he had to rebuke the entire church because there was a young man sleeping with his mother in law, and the church was full of apathy, and they did not discipline the man, and they just accepted it, and he had to come and rebuke them. Preach on, I am. So, I man, it's quiet in here. Y'all going to have to help me. Amen me, shout me down, woe me, or something. Number three, tempting Christ. Exodus 32. And I'm, I'm not going to read all this for sake of time, but here's the story. Moses goes up. He leaves Aaron, his associate pastor, with the children of Israel. Moses goes up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments of God. He's up there for 40 days. He's up there for a long time. He comes down only to find that the children of Israel has taken all their gold from their earrings and this and that. And they, according to Aaron's testimony, here's what he told Moses. Ready? This is in the it's just in their Bible, Exodus 32. Well, that they took their golds and stuff and they threw it in the fire and out popped the golden calf. No. They molded it into a golden calf. And in other words, Aaron didn't want to take personal responsibility. Well, I don't know what happened. They took their gold and all that and they threw it in the fire and then out. It's unbelievable. Moses out popped this golden calf and we all just started worshiping it. And Moses got so, Moses got so mad over them breaking one commandment, he broke all ten. He took the commandments and broke them and had to go back up. <laughs> Come on, Moses. Uh, Moses had no patience. How many believes that? He, he was always getting mad. I mean, he got an argument with God over them. These are your people. No, they're my people. And they, they got into this big argument over them. He was fed up with them. And they tempted God because they became impatient. How many of us? Oh, come on. I can bring this down on a practical level. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you're my healer. Yes, God, I stand on I stand on the stripes of Jesus that I'm healed. And you stand on all these scriptures. And then a week goes by, and nothing. Two weeks goes by, you're still standing. So three weeks goes by, you're still standing, but you're on one foot. And then four weeks goes by, now you're not standing anymore. You're on your knees. And then five weeks goes by, you're no longer standing nor kneeling. You're sitting down. Come on, you're sitting down on the standing on the promises of God. I, I, I never figured that out. How do people sing standing on the promises of God sitting down? So now they've turned. Now they've went from, Lord, I thank you that you're healing me, to, Lord, I hope you want to heal me. And then they move from faith to fear, and now they no longer trust God, and they're looking to every other avenue for healing. And they're doing things that are, are absolutely crazy. You'd be surprised. You think people that are bound by uh, prescription drugs just woke up one day and said, hey, I think I'm going to go get me some um, Percocets and all this other stuff and get just addicted to it. No. What happened was they have an injury and they take something and they feel so good, it's a euphoria. And they're like, wow, this feels so good. So they no longer rely on prayer but they rely on a pill. I almost say it again. They no longer rely on prayer, but they rely on the pill. So they exchange gods. Well, brother, don't talk about my stash, because that's for <laughs> that's for medicinal purposes. I'm so tired of hearing that. Well, brother, it's for medicinal purposes, and they got a whole barn full of it growing. Right, right. Well, I got some medicinal purposes for you. I got the great physician. I've got the balm of Gilead. I've got Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. He says, I am the Lord God who heals thee. But what am I talking about? Tempting Christ. Well, Lord, I know. Now listen, I'm going I'm to bring it home. Ready? I, I, I can assure you I can assure you that none of you, I don't have to worry about any of you going to a campfire, taking off your gold and silver, throwing it in the fire, and hoping a calf comes out and start washing. We ain't got to worry about that. But a uh, 
So, tempting God and idols could be anything. Let me explain. Gambling. I'm going to throw up some examples. If you're, uh, a gambling can become an idol. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to be very controversial. Do I condone gambling? Absolutely not. I don't, and I don't condone it, but I'm going to say something that a lot of people going to get mad at me about, maybe some of you, but I know you'll love me anyway. Ready? If, I go to, if you go to a store and you buy a scratch-off, I don't believe you're going to go to hell. I don't believe that. I don't think going and buying a scratch-off is going to send you to hell. I don't. But now here's what it, it could do. It could make your faith waver from trusting God as your source to trusting that as your source. And that, my friend, can send you to hell. Do, do y'all get that? But you'd be surprised. Again, people get up. I tell you, we saw Sister Bucket Mouth over there at... <laughs> At, at, the, at Chevron, and I saw her buying a stash of those scratch-offs, and if she was here today, I tell you, the ground would open up and hell would swallow her alive. Now, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Because that man, he, again, you're, you're getting into stuff that's just extra-biblical, and it's, it's outside. That is the true definition of judging someone because, again, that's your... Uh, listen... If you're a faithful tither, that's what's important. And so what you do with your money is your business. That's between you and God. But I, and, and I, I'm going to say something else. I don't believe, someone asked me this one time, do you believe that tithing is a salvation issue? No, I don't, personally. I don't believe tithing with or without ultimately will result in your salvation. Because I don't. I, it's the blood of Jesus that saves us. The redemption of His blood and accepting Him as Lord. Now, but however, I'm not going to take the chance. I'm just letting you know. Me, personally, I won't take the chance because the Bible says that no thieves will enter the kingdom of heaven. In Malachi chapter 3 says, Where have you robbed me? Saith the Lord, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. So you interpret that how you want. That's between you and the Lord, but not me. I'm not going to take that chance. But again, that's your business. Okay? So again, gambling can become an idol. So again, going back to what we were talking about. So if, if you have an issue with gambling, don't go to casinos. Don't go to parties. Don't go to atmospheres that condone this because you're going to get yourself in trouble. Number two, uh, anything, again, anything can become an idol. It, we're not going to wreck Moloch or Astroth or Baal, or a golden calf. I don't have to worry about that with any of you guys and most people listening to this uh, on internet. But your idol can be your car. Do you spend most of your time waxing and buffing and loving your car? Or do you put that above God? Maybe it's fishing. Maybe it's hunting. Come on. Maybe it's your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. They can become an idol. Did you know that when Moses died, the Bible says to this day, no man knows where they buried Moses' body? Do you know why that is? I'm going to give you a nugget. Ready? Have you ever read that and wondered why? You know why, Carol, they said that? Here's what my personal belief is. Because if, they would have, if the children of Israel would have found Moses' body, they would have erected it like a Pharaoh and they would have never got out of Egypt and crossed over. Because they were so, come on, and that's why Joshua had to say, Moses, thy servant is dead. We have to go on. Woo! I could preach an hour on that. And churches have erected their own Pharaoh. This is how God's always moved. God always moved through this type of music. God always moved through this type of service, through this type of preaching. We've always dressed like this. We've always started on this time. We've always done it like this. And they've erected that, and they've beaten that thing until it, I mean, they have, they have squeezed every little bit of juice out of that turnip, and there ain't nothing left. And so they keep going and keep going and keep going, and it's dead. And they have to move on to where God's moving now. Come on. So anything can become an idol. I'm going to say something heavy. Church can become an idol. What do you mean by that? You get pastors get so hung up on the euphoria of their uh, their head gets so big, and I pray I don't 
I pray, Lord, don't let, don't let that happen to me. In other words, we, they, they become swelled up. Look at me. Look at my ministry. It's all about me. And I, I've seen it. I've, got on, I've, I've gotten uh, emails from bishop, apostle, visionary, revolutionary, Thomas the Third. I'm like, seriously, man, you need that many titles? I don't, that stuff's goofy to me. I don't need all that. Because guess what? That, he ain't nobody. He's just a somebody for the Lord. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. And then, you know, plastering their face on every advertisement, billboards, commercials, this. I'm like, uh, again, it, it can become idolatry. Now listen. All right, so I'm on my last one, number four. Complaining. Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it and His anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses and then Moses prayed to the Lord and the fire was quenched. So He called the name of the place Tabara, Tabara, or I'm sorry, Tabra, because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. Numbers 11. Um, now, it's interesting because if you go to Romans, are you ready? I'm going to give you some scriptures on the mouth. Proverbs 6, 2. Ye are snared by the words of thy mouth. Proverbs 18, verse 7. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Proverbs 18, 21. The power of life and death is in the tongue. And then James, the book of James says that no man can tame the tongue. It's a small fire that boasts. It's a small member that boasts a great fire. With it we bless men, and with it we curse men. And this ought be not so. How can fresh water and bitter water flow out of the same fountain? And I know this is hitting everybody in the face this morning, <laughs> including, <laughs> including moi. <laughs> See, this is what the Lord always gives me messages. And I've said this before. He's going to step on my toes before He gets to yours. And complaining is so easy to do. Amen. How many believes it's a lot easier to complain than it is to keep your mouth shut? Amen. And you know the Bible says that even a fool is considered wise who keeps his mouth shut. Now I believe, and again this ain't in the Bible, but I believe that's a word for every husband. <laughs> a fool is even considered... Come on, because there's... <laughs> It's best to keep... Come on, guys. Sometimes it's best to just keep your mouth shut. But I know I'm right. Yeah, but you... Listen, you can win... You can win the battle but lose the marriage. I'm just being honest. Yeah, I, I, I told her I knew I was right and I got it right. Yeah, dummy. And you done wrecked the house that you're going to be in trouble for a week. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk to you. Kids don't want to talk to you. And, but you're a big man, ain't you? Sometimes you just got to keep your mouth shut and walk away. <laughs> Reach on, I'm going to. Listen, I remember, and I don't think I ain't, because I get tested twice as much as you do. I went to a KFC by where I live one time. And, we had, and I'll never go back to that KFC again. I'm just letting you know. I went there, and this, this lady was mad at me before I even took my order. She was, all right, you ever been there? Oh, y'all been to that KFC? No, I'm just... <laughs> Come on, they're everywhere. You know what I mean. You, you come to those places where they're already mad before you even get there. So I'm up there. I'm getting ready to take my order. She's <sighs> rolling her eyes and chomping her gum. And I'm like, um, so I'm trying to take my order. She cuts me off. Well, we don't have that. Okay. And then I was like, we don't have that. And I'm thinking, what, what do you have? And then uh, she's like, <sighs> and I mean, just... And she's making comments about me in front of me. So, come on. So I feel myself going over into the death zone. Maybe you don't know what that means. I feel the old man beginning to rise up. And I'm praying under my breath, Lord, you better do something quick because, uh, you know, uh, I may lay hands on her and it ain't going to be the blessing. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding, guys. Kidding. Look. They're like, what in the world? I'm kidding. No, my wife was there, but she was she was she walked away because she knew it was about to come what was about to happen. So needless to say, 
I was steaming. And I, I didn't curse, but I popped off the mouth and I said some things. And I said, we're done. I'm going. I said, let's get our stuff. We're leaving. And um, come on, don't take uh, your halos are sticking out a little bit. Won't you tuck them in your collar? <laughs> Act like y'all ain't never went through anything like that. <laughs> so, what am I talking about? Complaining. Now I got to bring this home. I want to show you something. But where it gets deeper is on a spiritual level. The children of Israel begin to complain against Moses. And leadership. And Miriam, remember, she complained against Moses and she got leprosy. And the Lord, the, the Moses began to cry out and said, God, you got to heal her. I need her. And he says, if this woman will repent and you'll pray for her, I'll heal her. And he did, remember? He had to set her outside the camp. So what's that tell us? Listen, we can murmur against one another, but it becomes a deadly toxin in the body. Complaining. Um, it becomes a deadly toxin in the bloodstream. And I'm telling you, it will lead to a lot of bad things. I'm just letting you know, I know people personally who I get around them and all they do is complain and they're always sick. I Now listen, I'm no medical physician, but I'm willing to bet you that there's a connection there. Because even the Bible says a merry heart does good like a medicine. Right? So, if a merry heart does good like a medicine, what does a complaining heart, murmuring, bitterness and all that... Come on, it's got to be the opposite effect. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just dropped something in, in me. I'm going to finish with this. Let me say this and then we're going to finish. There was a group of researchers that did a study on music and the effects of music. Now this is, they were talking about the words, uh, uh, words and the effects of words and music. They did all these tests. Now, they stuck, uh, they stuck plants, live plants in a room and they played, um, they played like uh, classical music, Christian music, worship praise. And the plants actually thrived and they became healthy and they grew. And they put, them, they put these plants in a room where, where uh, men of God would pray and who was speaking you know, prophetic things and, and declarations and the Word of God and these plants grew. Now, they stuck the same plants in another room where they played. Now listen, this is, this is probably going to get up in somebody's business, but I'm just letting you know, this is, again, I didn't do this. True, you can research it and find out. The group research really did this. They stuck these plants in a room where they played Certain types of rock and roll music, really, I mean, just very aggressive, loud music. They placed them, these plants in a room where people were shouting and screaming over these plants, curses, um, just curses. What am I talking about? You'll never amount to nothing. You're worthless. This They were just cursing and in verbal language. The plants after a period of time actually increased the longevity. They died quicker. Twice as quick as the ones who were in the other atmosphere. Now, they also did this test on water molecules under a microscope. And they discovered that when they took a glass of water and in a room with prayer, intercession, and music that was praise, worship, and so on and so forth, that the water molecules stayed together. And it formed what looked like a beautiful snowflake. But when they put it in the room where there was the cursing, the negativity, etc. in this room, that the water molecules actually begin to degrade and, and fall apart. Wow. And you do realize that your body is made up three-fourths water. So we don't realize when, when, when Solomon coined in Proverbs that power of life and death is in the tongue. That's just not a phrase, guys. It's reality. So this is why when parents speak over their children and they curse them from a little child, you'll never amount to nothing. You blankety blank, get out of here and call them all kinds of names and curse them. You don't think it's having a negative effect on them? Wow. And this is why, that now I do know this for a fact, that medical doctors will tell you the number one cause of cancer and diseases are stress related. Now, what do you think all that full, all that stuff is going to produce? Stress. Heavy loads of stress. Why do you think, again, let me back up, when you go to these restaurants and these people are already mad, 
Chances are, guys, it's not because of customers. It's because of what they're dealing with in their home life. And they're always just mad. And they bring it in there and it ventilates out. Because have you ever met somebody that they're just mad at the world? They hate the world. They're always, and it's sad. It breaks my heart. It's really sad. Um, I watched this documentary one time. This man, he, uh, he refused to get close to anybody. He was very racist. He was prejudiced. He, he hated everybody. He didn't want any friends. He, he called himself a loner. I don't want his, his, his. And it comes out when he was into this, uh, he was in counseling, and it all stemmed down to, guess what it stemmed down to? His father from his childhood left him. And when he, when he was in his life, he cursed him, said he would never amount to nothing. Because all this man, he, out of his mouth, he said, I'm always failing and I can never get anything right. Thus, if I don't get connected with anybody and, and, and get them close to me, I can't hurt them. And I won't fail them. Is that not sad? So why don't you all stand this morning? What am I talking about? I'm talking about four, four common pitfalls of every believer. Again, idolatry, sexual immorality, tempting Christ, and complaining. These four things, guys, I'm telling you, will keep us from going where we want to go and where God wants to take us. Listen, I'm a part of this too, guys. I Even I have struggles with some of these areas. I just told you that. I believe in transparency. I believe that if I tell you the truth about me, that you'll respect me more. I've taken off my Superman cape and saying, you know what, I'm just like you, I'm flesh. And I struggle with these things too. But I also recognize that if these things were written for our admonition, then I need to listen to what they're saying. Because if I fall prey to these things, then guess what, just as they fell, you and I will fall too. I don't want that to happen. Now, we want this church to go to the next level, don't we? We want a great revival. We want that church to be filled. We want people coming. Well, listen, we've got to get this out of the camp. So right where you're at, and if you're listening to this by internet, by radio, I don't care what church you attend, where you're at, but if you want to get these things out of your life, right where you're standing, come on, just bow your heads with me. I want you to start talking to God right where you're at. Just start talking to Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come on, just right where you're at. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just come before you right now, God. And we just ask, Lord Jesus, Father, that you would help us, God. Give us the grace. Give us the strength. Give us the ability, God, to overcome You're these things. The one who walked on water, and you come the Lord, your word says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read the rest of this real quick that I didn't read when I finished this. You're the one who welcomes sinners and you open blinded eyes. You restored the broken hearted and you brought the dead to life. The Bible says in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, you who think you're more spiritual than somebody else because you've not fallen into adultery, because you don't struggle with this or struggle with that, I want to give you a word what Paul said, take heed lest you fall. You are no different than anybody else. Instead of exalting yourself above everybody else, why don't you humble yourselves like Christ did and pray for your brother and your sister. And the Bible says, ye are more spiritual, lift them up. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Wow. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, God, give us the, the ability, give us the strength, God, to go forward, 
Father, I ask that you would begin to forgive us, God. Come on, just talk to him right here. Forgive us, Lord God, of anything that we've exalted above you and above your throne as an idol. God, there's nothing wrong with anything, uh, Lord God, that, uh, that may not be a, a sin in itself, but God, it can become sin when it becomes exalted above your throne. Lord, captivate our hearts. Captivate our minds. Lord, help us, Lord God. Lord, capture us, Lord God, right now, right where we're at, Lord. Father, I ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, if we're struggling with our mouth, God, Lord, give us the ability to keep our mouth shut when it needs to be, God. Give us the strength, God. Lord, we we ask that you'd forgive us of our murmuring and our complaining and our strife and our division and our discord that's come out of our mouth, God. But may our mouth speak the oracles of God. May they speak the words of God. May they encourage others. May they bless others. May they prosper in which that goes forth, Lord. May we fill our mouths with you, God, and your word, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that, Lord, we would not tempt you, God. And, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to guard our hearts, our eyes, and our minds, God, from sexual immorality. Lord, Job says, I make a covenant with my eyes. Why then shall thou look upon another woman? David said, I'll put no evil thing before my eyes. Lord, help us, God. When we are weak, God, it's easy to say yes, and it's easy to have the victory when we're in the church and when we're in the body and when we're amongst each other. But God, when we're alone, when, we're in the, when, when nobody else is looking, God, may then we have the victory. May then we look for the escape, God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. We give you glory and give you praise and give you honor. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, everybody said amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, how many enjoyed that this morning?